thank the organizers especially for organizing this meeting. Um, I am, I'm, thanks to Anne, I don't have to say a lot of the things I would normally talk about. Um, and uh, so there's a picture of Anne. You notice the striking resemblance to a former inhabitant of this place. Um, um, and um, I guess whose name will appear in a moment. And then um, there's, a, there's the Mont Saint Benet. I don't know whose hand that is holding up that, that bowl, but um, it's shadow art. Okay, so anyway, um, is this working? I'm, not, I'm a little bit worried. No, this is not working. Could it be that it's the wrong one that's in here or something? No, it is the same one, but I have the same problem. Let's, we can try this one. Oh, well, I'm going to use one. Oh. Oh, there it is. That worked. Okay, there we are. Julia Pereira. Now, now we know we're working. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, here we go. So much for jokes. Okay, so, um, right. So I'm going to, um, I want to remind you about why it is, um, just to give you sort of a broader background of, the, of why I think decision making is important and why studying noisy neurons is important. And, um, and that is because I think decision making offers a window on higher brain function in general. And um, as a neurologist, I think that the, the, um, the interesting insights that we get about mechanism by thinking about the problem at the level that we in this room think about this problem will one day lead to ways of treating disorders affecting higher brain function. And the, way, the reason that's so, I should have said, is because the principles revealed at the structure at the level that I think we can approach them in the behaving monkey uh, will ultimately explain things that seem unrelated in our broader cognitive um, repertoire in the human brain. And, and only by virtue of having more brains, essentially decisions to make decisions about decisions, sort of effectively cascading and recursively doing the operations that the monkey brain can do. But to fix those things in the brains of humans one day, if when our brains go awry in disease, we need to understand them at the level that I think is more practically approached uh, in the rodent, and so, um, so okay, so that's sort of a, a, an important background. The other thing is that Anne's already introduced is that a key feature in the expansion of the association cortex of the brain that occurred between rodent and monkey, and even more so between monkeys and humans, is this property known as persistent activity, and Anne has already introduced it, so I'll just tell you, just um, make one quick point, since we're in Catalonia, that this kind of spatially selective, uh, Sound terrible. Are you sure you, the, your volume's on like this? Yeah, your volume's on. Well, you just heard these nerds anyway, so it really doesn't matter. But that activity that you heard before was persistent activity, and played it for you anyway, and you know, that separates a, a little pulse of light before a monkey would make an eye movement sometime later. And this kind of persistent activity, I think, um, holds the key to higher brain function in the sense that it gives us a freedom from immediacy. It lets us connect our immediate past to the present to the future, and without it, we'd be hopelessly confused. So it's sort of a way of bridging between the kind of operations that are transpiring, especially in the association cortex, where you have this 
freedom from immediacy um, uh, compared to, say, the visual cortex or the sensory cortex that keeps up with the changing world or the motor cortex that has to keep up with the changing body. That's sort of a way to view the kinds of, 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 um, of, of, of operations in the association cortex as a window on cognition and I would argue and its disorders like confusion is what I'm alluding to. Okay, so um, this slide has already been shown, and I just want to point out that something that had plagued us for a long time in our studies of, of um, decision making was um, the idea of, of trying to connect at the single trial level of a, an operation that seems to do such a beautiful job of, of explaining the speed and accuracy, speed versus accuracy trade off in at least uh, one class of, of very simple decisions. And um, I just want to point out this very old slide from Jamie Reutemann um, uh, and Anne showed you uh, responses like that that show firing rate as a function of time while the monkey is making a decision, in this case in the reaction time version of the task, about the direction of random dot motion. And you're seeing these, these average responses that look kind of like accumulations or meanderings uh, based on the uh, sign and direction of motion, strong motion, fast buildup or intense uh, decline and the weakest motion, something in between, um, uh, still giving away ultimately what the monkey's choice will be. And, um, and we um, know that those neurons, this, these neurons in association cortex, so they're in their persistent activity, are representing some intermediate kinds of quantities, not just a latch to a high state, an up state, or a low state, but rather doing some interesting kind of computation that we think is related to accumulation of evidence to some critical level or bound. Uh, that terminates the decision. Okay, so you're all aware of that. Uh, I do want to point out that that um, um, <coughs> that this um, mechanism that we have in mind, which is termed uh, evidence accumulation or bounded evidence accumulation or random walk to bound or bounded diffusion, um, is um, is a, is is uh, is a cartoon. It's not, um, uh, the, the, you know, it requires a certain amount of elaboration to really get things right, like reaction time distributions and error uh, reaction times. But, uh, and I'm going to ignore some of the details of it, uh, like the fact that we think the bounds collapse, or as Anne showed, really there's a race between two mechanisms, and therefore the bounds don't have to collapse, but there can be additive signals that you can sort of consider like soft, soft deadlines. We call those urgency. Um, but all of those things, the beauty of this, and what it convinced us that there's something to this basic idea is that if you fit data, reaction time data, from a monkey, in this case, so reaction time being the time that elapsed from onset of motions to the beginning of the monkey's eye movement, and we plot that as a function of, of, of viewing of motion strength. When the motion's strong, the monkey's taking less than half a second in this experiment, and when, he's, when the motion's weak, he's taking almost a second, 800 milliseconds, you see. And, um, and this smooth curve fit through the data is a fit of this very simple, the simplest form of this diffusion model. Okay, there's a key, key parameters are the bound height, which instantiates the speed accuracy trade-off, right? The intuition being the further you um, place the bound from the starting point of the accumulation, the more um, evidence uh, gets to acquire, the monkey gets before he makes his answer. So that's, that would support accuracy, but at the cost of time, because it takes longer to reach the bound. And then one other term that's important here that takes the motion strength and uh, converts it to signal to noise. So that turns out to just be a constant proportionality. Okay, so, so that, that basically explains this curve outside of the non-decision time, which I won't talk about. Um, but the cool thing about this is that if you fit the monkey's or human's reaction time and you hypothesize that the mechanism that gave rise to that was a mechanism like this, then you've used up all your degrees of freedom to explain choice. And you're in this very unusual position in psychophysics where you have to predict that at these two motion strengths, the monkey will be perfect and he will tend towards chance, this is proportion correct, so chance being 0.5 down here, um, that he'll tend towards chance at exactly this rate. And that's pretty close to where the data lie. So I just want to, I want, I, I want you to, to appreciate how powerful that is. It's very rare in psychophysics that you can make one set of observations and use them to really predict a whole different kind of set of observations. Okay, so the thing wrong with this very simple model, as I said, we understand a lot of those things that are wrong, so there's, but, but the, the basic element seems to be there. And it convinced us that these kinds of, of responses that we see on average really do represent something like the accumulation. Their fire, the firing rate of these neurons looks something like um, the integral dt of something coming out of the visual cortex, which other experiments told us was a difference, right minus left, okay, and left minus right, things like that. I'll come back to that at the end. Okay, so now 
So to study this, though, that's a hard... We, ha we had trouble really convincing ourselves that there weren't that alternatives like changes suddenly along the trial at different times in the trial would, would also lead to averages like this. You, you know, if you have something that steps up and it steps up at a different time and you take averages of those things, then um, it might look like ramp on average. So, um, so one way to go about figure about uh, testing the hypothesis that these these average responses really reflect a bunch of diffusion paths, like the ones that Anne showed you, where the diffusion path is the rate that you'd compute by integrating the difference in in, in rates, what I would call um, momentary evidence coming out of the visual cortex. But one way to do that is just to do a different experiment where you basically slow down time and ask monkeys to accumulate something else. And I'll just show you a quick example of that. Here's a, a neuron, uh, just like the ones I showed you, the response goes over here. I'm not going to tell you everything about this task, but the monkey is going to make a decision about a bunch of shapes that he sees. And these shapes, they come and they go, and the monkey knows that some shapes are support, are su uh, support right and some shapes support left. And what you see here is in this particular version of this task, it's a new one that we've been doing, uh, that where the monkey does um, reaction, it's a reaction time version, you see that the, that the evidence is wandering around. This is the accumulated evidence based on one, two, three, four, five, six shapes. We know the monkey ignored that last shape. It didn't contribute to his choice. But you see what's happening here is, is um, an, an accumulation of evidence, first a meandering of it, um, and associated with that is these changes in the spike rate. And it turns out if I showed you many such trials, I would convince you that these gaps in between the spikes here where the rate is low and this longer gap here where the rate seems to be at its nadir is real. That that's, that's what you're seeing are neurons that are, in fact, doing running sums of numbers, you know, in this case, numbers assigned to shapes. Okay, so, so the idea, so that's a way of slowing down time, doing just a different kind of experiment than random dots and seeing that the neurons in their firing rate are representing the accumulation of evidence. But I want to, I want to now go back to Anne's, oh, here's another trial, I can't resist. They're just fun to watch. Um, that, was, that was one of the longer reaction time trials. And you can see that I've, I've aligned the spikes so that they're, they're coming right above the representation of shape one, then the accumulation after two shapes, after three, and so forth. And you kind of get the idea that the spikes rate instantaneously is kind of m matching the accumulation of evidence. So you can imagine that across many trials, since the evidence is going to be different on every trial, and this, this gets to Alfonso's uh, point, uh, that, that that's going to lead to different, different kinds of variants. So that's the variance that's originating in the stimulus completely, okay? Uh, of course, there's presumably variance that's, rep that's also rep in the brain, representing each of the shapes or the assigned likelihood uh, that's associated to each of the shapes and so forth. Okay, so now, ooh, okay, yeah, I, I, I changed the order of my slides. I will answer question one at the end of the talk. I thought it'd be more fun to do that. But um, so we're asking, you know, what's the role of, of neural variability in decision making? Well, one is it limits fidelity. Another one is it calls for some kind of temporal smoothing. You'll see why I say that in, in later, because the answer to why there's noise in the brain really comes down to time. I'll come back to that. Um, remind me if I forget. Um, it, it calls for robustness in recurrent, oops. It calls for robustness in recurrent circuits. Like when we, as we get more and more realistic, as some of you have in your work, uh, trying to uh, not think in the abstract about statistical analogies, but actually neural me mechanisms, um, noise is, uh, is a big problem for things that uh, involve recurrence, for example, or any kind of attractive dynamics, um, and needs to be taken seriously. And then its particular form, where the variance is proportional to mean, supports certain kinds of regularities. This is a much deeper issue, but one we can talk about over line, such that a difference variable computed from random numbers that are represented by neurons that whose variance is proportional to mean will approximate bug likelihood ratios. And that's a very convenient regularity that the brain can use to, for example, uh, assign a degree of belief to, um, to a decision variable, uh, and not have to necessarily assign it because it's sampled the state of the decision variable in, in all possible ways, of, 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 uh, in all possible experiments. So in other words, it's possible to just be told something about probability and instantiate it, like a prior probability and just instantiate it by changing a bound height without ever having experienced that in the past. So those are fun things, and we, those are things we can talk about. Um, the other thing is that correlated variability among neurons preserves trial-by-trial trial correlations between 
spike counts in choice, that's been discussed already today. Rate of rise, what we sometimes call a buildup rate and reaction time, trial by trial. Rate of rise and the probability that an animal will opt out in a confidence, a post-decision wagering task. Um, rate in one epoch and, uh, uh, and rate of rise in another epoch, that's in a timing study that we're, that we're trying desperately to publish from Merdad Jazairi. Um, and, um, and counts in different epochs, which gets me to this um, correlation. Anyway, so the point is, is that uh, the reason I'm putting this up is because as we start wondering, I mean, part of this meeting is to go back and start revising our thinking about, you know, some of the early ideas we had on this topic. And, um, and so, but as we do that, I, I just want to remind us of some of the a great power of recognizing that neurons are weakly, in fact, weakly correlated with one another. Okay, so now I'm going to pick up on the, on, on the theme that Anne um, uh, um, started, which is to use this interesting um, quantity, look at the variance of the neurons across many trials to try to understand what's going on on single trials from single firing rates. Remember, the challenge is, I, the way I see it, the challenge is I've got the average firing rate in a, in a, from neurons that look like they represent a decision variable. We think the decision variable is the accumulation of noisy numbers that are stationary and in some sense independent, identically distributed. So we think that our firing rate on a single trial should conform to the statistics of diffusion. But we don't know a firing rate in a single trial because all we get is a bunch of spikes and the gaps between them. Okay, so, so we exploit this variance tool uh, to get at it. And uh, Anne's already introduced the tool, um, and, um, and it basically comes from marrying two very simple ideas, the theory of doubly stochastic point processes with the laws of total variance and covariance. And so the law of total variance, everyone here is familiar with it because you, you, you kind of think about this every time you compute an R squared or a residual with respect to a regression line or anything like that. It just says if you have a, some variable X that depends on Y, the total variance can be divided into two terms. A variance of a conditional expectation, okay, um, this is what Anne called bare CE, and I'll call it bare CE just that I screwed up the slide. And, a, um, and an expectation of a conditional variance, okay? And one of these would kind of correspond to your residuals, and one of them would correspond to your, your uh, predictions if you were fitting a line, for example. And the, and, and the same, same principle that applies to sum of squares applies to this, okay? So that's all the law of total variance is. And when applied to doubly stochastic point processes, we can say that the total measured variance of counts in some epoch i Okay, is this var CE quantity, it would be, it's sort of like saying, give me the integral of rate along that epoch, and I can tell you on every trial, I'm going to get a different expected count, but I want to know what that variance is. Okay? So that's what, that's what Anne was getting at with var CE. And then this last term is this, this expectation of the conditional variance is, is something that we be, by applying um, to uh, the, the theories of doubly stochastic point processes here, we can simplify this and say that that's the expectation of, of that, that will have an expectation that's very simple. It will be essentially a number that's proportional to its mean. And that's, that idea is just saying, is, 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 is incorporating a, a general assumption, an assumption about that the spikes are, obey a, a property of, of generalized renewals. Generalized renewals being, as you know, a, a renewal in stochastic processes is, is, is a stochastic process whose, whose um, intervals are I, I, in, independent, identically distributed. Now, obviously, if the rate's changing, then the intervals are not identically distributed. So the idea behind a generalized renewal is that basically you achieve the same properties as a renewal, but just by scaling time. Okay, so, so if I told you I had a renewal that obeyed some gamma distribution of intervals, it would be a generalized renewal if when I changed the rate, I just sort of scaled time on the gamma distribution and left it the same, okay? And those processes have what's called a Fano factor, which is a theory, I want you to not think of a Fano factor as something you measure in data, but a theoretical entity associated with, st with non-stationary uh, stochastic processes that, that have this renewal property, just generalized renewal property. They have Fano factors in their count statistics, that is their counts, their, their the variance of the counts is proportional to the mean of the counts. That's true of that. So for a non-stationary Poisson process, we don't expect the intervals to be distributed by a single exponential distribution. It's a mixture of many exponentials because it's non-stationary. But the Fano factor, okay, associated with that will be one, okay, even though the rates were changing, which is why people like that term, okay? 
Now, okay, I know I'm covering ground that Anne covered. A beautiful uh, work on this, I think, is from uh, Martin Naurat, who is at one of the Bernstein centers, and I recommend this paper. It's a little obscure. I think it's not cited enough. It's a beautiful paper. Um, okay, so anyway, so we, uh, as Anne pointed out, one of the bugaboos of this whole idea is that we don't know this value phi. It's not something you really can measure in data, and, and it's sort of, you can, might think of it as a fudge factor. I think it's somewhat principled. But since we, none of us really believe that neurons are handed a rate and then try to express it by spitting out spikes according to some non-stationary point process, um, the, um, this is just a statistical contrivance that allows us to look at data and extract something from it. It's a bit like looking at the mean across many trials. We get the idea, there's a lot of noise, a lot of variability, but we get the idea of what the underlying, um, say, dynamics look like when we take the, uh, a firing rate average. And, um, and so we're going to do the same thing with VARC. We're going to kind of look past the spiking of the neuron and look at that underlying rate. Okay, so Anne already did that for you, so I'll skip now to the, uh, the part that she left for me, thankfully, which is the, um, um, which is the uh, law of total covariance. It's the same basic idea, is that, is that um, now you have, um, again, a conditional, you have, you have one random variable count in this case again, it's conditional on another one rate, except we're considering two epochs, i and j. So we have a covariance of the conditional expectation, and then we have an expectation of the conditional covariance, that is, you know, if you knew the two rates. Okay, now that, this again simplifies in a really nice way, because applying this contrivance that, that we're thinking about the spiking as being caused by these rates, if the rates are separated, then the variability and the spiking in the counts are independent. So what we, if we measure the total uh, a covariance matrix, just the measured covariance, will, it will be e equal to the, co to the covariance of the conditional expectation um, for, all the non for all the off diagonal terms of our covariance matrix by fiat. I'm just say stating that by assumption, okay? And then, so the only terms that, um, that convert a measured, uh, you know, an estimate of the covariance, okay, epoch to epoch. Remember, I'm talking about epochs now within a trial, right? So, so uh, maybe, maybe should have made that clear. Um, that that um, d does everyone get that? That I'm talking about the epoch of the spiking at the beginning of the of say integration, and then another epoch over. These are counting windows, so I have to jump in in steps. Okay, I'm going to use 60 milliseconds like Anne did. Okay, so so when I ma create the covariance matrix for many such trials. Okay, let's say I, I take this, a six by six covariance matrix using the first 360 milliseconds of the, of the putative integration period to do it. I, I measure the covariance, and that is the covariance of the conditional expectation for all the off diagonal terms, okay? Or at least it, would, it, 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 it is. And then, but for the diagonal terms, that's the variance term, so I just do exactly what Anne did. I substitute the, the variance of the conditional expectation um, for that conditional expectation, and then we have an expectation of the conditional covariance, that is, you know, if you knew the two rates. Okay, now that, this again simplifies in a really nice way, because applying this contrivance that, that we're thinking about the spiking as being caused by these rates, if the rates are separated, then the variability and the spiking in the counts are independent. So what we, if we measure the total uh, a covariance matrix, just the measured covariance, will it will be E equal to the, co to the covariance of the conditional expectation um, for, all the non -di for all the off diagonal terms of our covariance matrix by fiat. I'm just say stating that by assumption, okay? And then, so the only terms that, um, that convert a measured, uh, you know, a an estimate of the covariance, okay, epoch to epoch. Remember, I'm talking about epochs now within a trial, right? So, so uh, maybe, maybe should have made that clear. Um, that, that, um, do, does everyone get that, that I'm talking about the epoch of the spiking at the beginning of, the, of say, integration and then another epoch over, these are counting windows, so I have to jump in, in steps, okay, I'm going to use 60 milliseconds like Anne did, okay? So, so when I create the covariance matrix for many such trials, okay, let's say I, I take this, a six by six covariance matrix using the first 360 milliseconds of the, of the putative integration period to do it, I, I measure the covariance, and that is the covariance of the conditional expectation for all the off diagonal terms, okay? Or at least it, would, it, 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 it is. And then, but for the diagonal terms, that's the variance term, so I just do exactly what Ann did. I substitute the, the variance of the conditional expectation um, for that, okay? So that's all we have to do. Now I want to, um, uh, so the theory goes like this. Anne showed you these graphs. In fact, she just gave me this during breakfast. 
Um, so this is, it turns out, one beautiful thing about, about the, um, this, this, oh, sorry, then you, then you, do, I'm going to do one more step, which I'll normalize the, cov the covariance of the conditional expectation and, and make it a correlation matrix, the, you know, the usual way, okay? And so, um, so this represents, using a heat map, the expected covariance of conditional expectation for diffusion, okay? I'll come back and tell you some of the interesting features, but you see it's, it's, it, there's, there's this, let me just, this top row is the um, correlation between the first epoch and the second, third, fourth, and so forth. And you can see it's falling off, the cooler colors being less correlation. And then you see there's this other feature that, that as you go like these, the, if you go to along the first juxtadiagonal here, those, those are all um, bins that sep are separated by the same amount. They're adjacent 60 millisecond bins, but you see the correlation is increasing. The colors are getting darker. Those, that's sort of the two key features. I want to point out, though, that for unbounded diffusion, this, um, this is very easy. Every element in this is just the square root of i over j, if i is row number and j is column number, okay? Uh, I, I'm the upper triangle, i less than j, okay? Then, and the intuition there is, is that think of a process, think of, think of, the, think of the, comp the total variance out to the jth step, okay? It's just j times the variance of each of the independent increments, right? We're accumulating j random numbers, okay? Okay, so we get a total variance that's proportional to j. And if we've gone out i up to that, then conditional on knowing the value at i, then we know that that's the fraction of the variance that's, that, that we've explained. A few steps later, you can think about it. It's really trivial. So the square root of that, of that ratio is the R value. Yeah? So I have a question on understanding, but if it takes too long to answer, it's going to be difficult. But I would understand the talk perfectly if we were talking about correlations between two neurons. Right. The two neurons were participating in the same accumulation of having a full bound. But because you're talking about correlation of one neuron's activity with itself a yeah. few seconds later, I'm not understanding why we care. Oh, we care because it's going to let us, it's, again, this is a tool for looking at signatures of diffusion on the single trial level. So we're talking about, if I said autocorrelation, then I wouldn't be confusing you as much, I suspect, okay? So this is the autocorrelation, but it's not the usual autocorrelation histogram you're used to. It's just the autocorrelation between the counts I get now and the counts I get from that same neuron on the same trial, uh, you know, sometime later. Okay? And I'm saying that is also something specified by diffusion. No degrees of freedom here. If, in fact, specified for any cumulative sum of IID random variable, you should have a correlation that every one of these little squares would have R value square root I over J. Okay? And that, that's a really strong constraint. No degrees of freedom. Okay? That's what it must be. And Anne pointed out some alternative models things where there are time-dependent scaling, in which case there's basically no correlation, or things where there's a variable rate of rise, um, which comes up, say, in the Ratcliffe um, model, he has a variable rate of rise. And if, he, and if that were true, we wouldn't see anything like this, we'd see something like this, okay? Variable rate of rise is kind of a crazy idea, I should just say, for those of you who study diffusion, because it, it, it's basically kind of contradictory, because if you, it kind of implies long autocorrelation times in the evidence itself, like the random dot motion or the noise in, in MT, okay? Because other, and if you had such a thing, why would you integrate? It's just, so it doesn't make any sense in the first place, okay? So, so, so if you meet, so anyone who knows Wagenmachers, some, ex, please explain that to him. He doesn't understand that. Okay, so um, um, Ratcliffe, you can't explain it to him because um, he doesn't listen. Okay, so, um, but, um, so now I want, to, so I want to just show off a little bit. We've just used this tool. It's a really powerful tool. And so this is unpublished work, but I, you're fine to record it. Um, the, um, the, um, from Victor uh, De La Fuente, um, so a former postdoc. And what he did was he trained monkeys to do reaches and eye movements, studying neurons in MIP and LIP. MIP is just like LIP, except that it's, pre, it's, 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 it's projecting to premotor areas, okay, uh, involved in reaching. <laughs> Okay, and so this is, looks complicated, but it is in blocks. He either cues the monkey that in the block he's going to answer with his hand or he's going to answer with his eye, and whatever he's not doing he has to hold fixed for, you know, for the, throughout the trial. Okay, so that's it. It's not a reaction time task, and these monkeys are trained, so it, it so happens they're just almost identical in, in their performance. It's not a reaction time task. Okay, and if we look at the psychophysical kernel or whatever you like to call it, um, the, um, the, we think these monkeys are only integrating for on order three, 400 milliseconds max, really the average, even for the 0% coherence stimulus, we think is more like 250 milliseconds, okay? So which, by the way, is something I think we got wrong in the original work, 
um, uh, when, with Newsom. So in that 96 paper, we always assumed in those days, because we believed in ideal observers, what, you know, and I think we all make the mistake when we use the O word, optimum optimal, um, but we believe that the monkey must be counting all the spikes in a two-second display. Now that just seems so stupid in retrospect. Um, but, um, but, but the numbers are, in this particular case, and this, these monkeys were not, I think, terribly well trained, but they were, um, they were integrating out for, a, we think, on order uh, 300 milliseconds, let's say. So, um, and uh, that actually matters, but I'm going to gloss over that, okay? So, and this has a characteristic signature. This is the impulse response of a motion energy uh, for just two pulse motion in our display, and this is the correlation between the motion energy and the monkey's choice of the 0% coherent uh, motion task, okay? Okay, so now, if you look at the average firing rate from MIP across the top, LIP across the bottom, on reach trials, left column, Saccades, you see responses that look in every instance like kind of like decision variables. LIP is no big surprise. Maybe it's a surprise that it should have been as responsive as it was during the reaching. Um, and um, MIP very strong in the reach, a lot less strong in the saccades. But look, there's coherence dependent changes. They're roughly linear with motion strength. Um, these, this is a way of viewing the, the, the responses that have in it, you might think, a choice confounder, but basically you're looking at the, at the raw responses for each, mo each signed motion strength. So, the, the, so errors are included in this, and so this is what we think the decision variable looks like. And that saturation, as someone pointed out uh, earlier, is, uh, is, is, is because we think the monkey reaches an internal bound on many trials, even though we're not measuring reaction time. Okay? Now, so you look at that, and, you, and we would, I, would have, I would have thought that there was a decision variable here in all these conditions. But now we apply this tool. So again, here's the theoretical. I'm only showing you the upper, upper triangular part, the, the 15 unique R values for this 6 by 6 correlation matrix. Here they are um, and for, from theory for unbounded diffusion. Um, and here here's they are for the, these, those four conditions. And you know, just by eye, you see that you've got the basic features kind of correct here. Remember I told you that the two kind of things to think about are this, is this upper row, which is the correlation with the first epoch of putative integration with the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and then this first juxtadiagonal, which are 60 milliseconds away, what's the count, but at the beginning, at the next 60, at the next 60, at the next 60, and so forth, is time. Yeah, but, yeah good. Okay, so anyway, to make a long story short, if I look at those at those um, at that at that upper row in dashed, and at this this row, and now what I do is I allow that phi that new that parameter that's kind of the bugaboo in the whole idea, but I let that be the one degree of freedom and try my best to find a phi that lets me entertain the idea that what I'm seeing here in the rates is an accumulation. Okay, then this is the best I can do. I do really well with MIP reach. I do really well with LIP saccade. Pretty well LIP reach. And, um, but I cannot do it for MIP saccade, okay? So that's kind of cool. So that's using this tool not only to uh, support the idea that you're seeing diffusion on single trials, but also um, to even um, get a little bit of a stronger purchase in a situation where I might have convinced myself we saw diffusion and now I can't, okay? And, and the VAR CE supports that too because now with the fee fit here, I calculate the VAR CE without any degrees of freedom and it's roughly linear in all conditions except for this one the M MIP under the saccade block. Okay, so now I'm going to um, close by with uh, trying to get back to that first question that we were posed, which is what's the origin of variability? And they really come down to um, these um, five things. Uh, a balance in between excitation and inhibition, and I'm gonna expand on that in a second. The world, which includes random dot motion. Um, uh, and, um, but uh, in other words, there's variability not just in the brain, but in the world. And I think actually we've been very sloppy about that in our work. Um, we now, I think, with still haven't really nailed it, but I would say that probably 50% of the variability on that order is in the stimulus, okay? Um, uh, but a lot of it is in the brain. And, um, whoops. Uh, state, and that was already mentioned, I think uh, Albert mentioned it in his um, introduction, things like attention, things like the configuration of the circuit, all kinds of things we don't really understand about, you know, what makes the, the brain, uh, anyway, various, various things that we wouldn't really attribute to the kinds of noise that I've been so invested in, which really revolve around this and this last one, correlation. But cuidado on this one, or cuidarse, I guess, is um, because I think a lot of people just kind of screw up the correlation argument, and I want to just remind us of why there is noise, okay? Why it matters and why it's there. The reason we have noise is because in cortex, 
The brain computes with intensity parameters, not with spikes, but intensity parameters, because it's doing interesting computation, not just passing on a spike from the retina through the LGN under some condition or not, and not on some other condition. But it's, it's, it's computing with intensity, spike rate, in the intervals between any one neuron spikes. That is the design problem that faces the entire cortex, okay? Anything that's going to compute something new from something else. So, and the problem is, is that to do that, to have a rate represented continuously, as close to continuously as possible in time, you must have many, many versions in a spiking of spiking neurons that are representing the same quantity. And to have that, that leads to, the, to uh, a surfeit of excitation if we just look at how many inputs it takes to cause a neuron to reach spike threshold, okay? And what is required to achieve this goal is to balance that excitation with inhibition. And by balance, I don't mean conductance. I don't know what I mean. I mean, what I mean is that the neuron has to have the roughly the same dynamic range as any one of its inputs, okay? And that's probably done with really clever mechanisms that allow, with voltage-gated yada yada that gives, that keeps the, that keeps distal dendritic input from having access to the soma and all kinds of things, okay? That people probably um, misconstrue as, you know, fancy computation, but really it achieves this extremely important thing of, of a balance between excitation and inhibition, maybe among other very interesting things too. Okay, so, um, and so to do that, neurons need to share connections, and you saw that cartoon from one of my earlier papers about that. And this correlation ultimately limits the improvement of averaging and temporal resolution of rate. Now, I'm not saying anything about, about the computation you do with a neuron that represents SI and a neuron that represents SJ in a probabilistic population code, okay? That's a different kind of correlation. I'm talking about at one, for one message to get through to be used in computation, you need many neurons that represent it. And the fidelity of that one value, it's one element of your vector that you're computing with, that element is limited, the fidelity on that element is limited by, cor by correlations. And it's the correlations, not at a distance, it's the correlations of the many neurons that share the same, that share connections with it by virtue of representing more or less the same thing. Okay, so there's, I won't, won't bore you with that. You can't build a brain that way. You have to build it something like that. Okay, now I want to remind you about the temporal aspect of this, and I'm going to stop. The temporal aspect is that if I have, if I want to represent a rate, and the rate um, and I had many neurons and they were independent, I could represent that rate with better fidelity, okay? I'm sure you all know this argument. But if I, if I want to represent a rate, this is the ergodic assumption of the physiologist, right? That many trials, um, many trials are like one trial with many neurons, right? Not true because of weak correlation. If you, if you just say here, I've now generated whatever, 100, 100 trials, now this represents 100 weakly correlated neurons all trying to represent whatever this is, 50 spikes per second. This is what the ensemble rate would look like, okay? And if I build, use 500 instead of 100, I don't improve, right, if I assume the same correlation structure, okay? So, you know, we can formalize that and say, hey, say the rate was changing very slowly or it was undergoing this little, you know, frequency sweep. How could we represent, could we see the difference between that and no, no change in the rate at all at 50, at, at 50 hertz? And the answer is no. You could, very, you could if the neurons were independent, but if the neurons have weak correlation, then no. Yes, you can tell this thing, that was the 4 hertz mod, or the 20 hertz modulation going up to 32, no problem. But, but a constant rate, um, I mean, I, I, I would argue that you could tell this as different from that. But you couldn't tell that this was different from that, okay? And so, so the idea is that correlation does affect us. It, it's, 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 it affects the ability to compute fast, okay? Now, we pay a giant price for it, and we get a big win for it. We get a win for it as scientists because what it implies is, is that any one neuron being weakly correlated to a, lo a lot of the other neurons to, in, that it's part in whose co computation it's participating is A, a reasonable proxy for that whole pool because the improvement in signal to noise that you get from averaging the many neurons, which presumably the brain is doing, um, is, is um, uh, on the order of only threefold better than one neuron, okay? But what you got for that was the ability to compute res reasonably fast. I put a cap on it at you know, something less than 100 hertz. Probably it's less than what it would take to see flicker in the, in the lights, you know, at reasonable um, uh, dynamic range of firing rates. That's what ultimately limits this. Is, but, but, um, 
Um, but so, but it's, so it's a big win to be able to compute with intensity in the interspike interval of any one input. Okay, that's the big win. And then the lose, you might say, is that you don't get all the all the improvement in signal to noise that you would have wanted if you could have designed a brain where all the samples were independent. Well, no, that's our bad luck. Um, but the other win we get as experimentalists is that anyone's neur neurons fluctuations ends up correlating trial by trial with various things you can measure, and that was that list I gave you a, mo a moment ago, the things that often get called choice probability. But um, just to, uh, to pick up on your point, up on the much better way of doing choice probability, if I had it over again, we would have never done choice probability. I would do everything with logistic regression and said, here are the, all the factors, including the motion energy and the stimulus, and this is the extra thing I get from the, you know, from the spike rate moment by moment. Um, that would be a much better way to do it. I wish we all did that. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Regarding your last argument on the uh, on the origin by this noise, <clears throat> and I I think it depends on two assumptions. One is that uh, you have something like a PSTH readout, and that you don't allow for um, heterogeneity. So if you have heterogeneity yeah. rather than noise, then you can achieve basically the same advances, advantages without noise, which would be from an information theoretic perspective um, more desirable. Right. Yes, I agree with that. So, so you could, I mean, the critical thing in your argument is, and, and Rolf's, is that, is that you, you know, you have, the, the downstream readout has to be pretty clever. And has to be Chris, regarding your last argument on the, uh, on the origin by this noise, <clears throat> and I, I think it depends on two assumptions. One is that uh, you have something like a PSTH readout, and that you don't allow for um, heterogeneity. So if you have heterogeneity yeah. rather than noise, then you can achieve basically the same advances, advantages without noise, which would be from an information theoretic perspective um, more desirable, right? Yes, I agree with that. So, so you could, I mean, the critical thing in your argument is, and, and Rolf's, is that, is that you, you know, you have, the, the downstream readout has to be pretty clever and has to basically know the firing rate kind of label of your neuron. Not just like it represents the same stimulus uh, dimension or whatever, you know, but it has to know that. It has to know that it's a 20 spikes per second at peak neuron versus a 50 spike per second at peak neuron. And then you, could, you might get away with it. I think it's, I think it's unrealistic for the following reasons, that most of the, the readout, the clever readouts that you guys have thought about um, are ones that, um, that require you effectively, at some point, a subtraction occurs effectively. Now, if you're reading out across a population, I have no problem with that, because now you have heterogeneity that I can live with. But if you're reading across the neurons that are there, that are supporting the same value of, you know, that are basically, you could think of them as effectively like independent, or almost independent samples, of the same set of numbers, then you expect those neurons to have fire rates that are very near each other, okay? And probably the heterogeneity we see in the cortex is because we get away with choosing any one neuron as a proxy for the neurons that are actually the projection neurons or whatever, you know? So, so, and once you subtract there, then you're throwing out the baby with the bathroom. Yes, you're removing shared correlation, which kind of cleans up the signal, which is the intuition for why those mechanisms work, okay, why they survive the correlation, but you also share thrown out the signal because you subtract two numbers that are very near each other. So you're working with, you're working with signals that are effectively zero. So that's why, that's, so that, that's, that's, that's why I think ultimately, although you're absolutely correct, obviously, mathematically, I think it's not something the brain can actually um, avail itself of. Should, can we hold the questions? Because we're getting very quick. Do you want to ask a quick question? Okay. Very quickly. She said the stimulus would be about 50% of the variance. The random yeah. Uh, that 50% would go into bar scene, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. And then, right, so, so we're. That, we're that if you use the same stimulus, uh, how much would you expect bar C to go down? Well, that's tricky because the actual, there's two things we don't know to get to bar CE. One, I think we can kind of get at. One, so, bar CE is, is, is a mapping. Don't forget, we're looking at LIP. So if we were looking at the actual number I would calculate from the difference in MT, I could tell you what that variance is because I think I know how noisy the pools are applying these correlation type arguments.
Okay? There's something I don't really know because I kind of alluded to this and forgot to elaborate. But the what the what ha one of the reasons, one of the consequences of noise is that it forces us to do some temporal blurring so that we don't see and we don't compute with those peaky looking uh, PSDH like things that I was saying are the, the ergodic version of the ensemble firing rate, right? So, so, and we don't know what that is. So, so even at the level of telling you what is the variance of an increment, I don't really know what that number is, but I can, I can ballpark that. Okay. Now the problem is then you get to LIP and you have a mapping of that into LIP firing rate. Okay. So now that gets a little bit messy. Now in theory, the very CE, if we get the PPV part right and fee right and all that, in theory we should be able to strip all that out and incorporate all that in fee. But I don't really think we can. On the other hand, if you, you should be able to play games with the variance by, fool, by fooling around with it. You know, and you should be able to have you know, an experimental handle on that. And I think by doing that you might be able to infer what the fraction is. Okay, thanks. Thanks again.